You know her from the classic television show, Facts of Life and Deadwood. She was on the soap opera, uh, The Young and the Restless. She has performed at the White House, not once, not twice, but three times, right? Three? Um, yeah, three times. Three times at the White House. Uh, she is an author. Um, she has written an episode for a hit television show, 21 Jump Street. She has a loving cat. She's been in, she's a dear friend and one of the funniest people. And she brings me so much joy. And she keeps me breathing. Jerry Jewell. Jerry Jewell. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> Did you mention Deadwood? What? Did yeah, you mean? Yeah. Uh, not only that, she's hearing impaired. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I'm becoming hearing impaired too. So you get to a certain age, we all have that, right? Or not. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm okay. Um. It's Mother's Day today. Yeah, it is. And so I feel good. I feel like, you know, mom kind of, my mom passed away 27 years ago. And I can feel her very strongly today. Yeah. She's here. And I'm a fur baby mama. I've had so many cats, I can't tell you. But right now I just have Juliet. And Juliet gave me this t-shirt today. Oh, because you're her mama. Yeah, I can't believe she went shopping during a pandemic, really. <laughs> she was walking right down those aisles looking for the perfect shirt. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> and I hope to God she was wearing a mask. <laughs> uh, do, was, she, was she wearing her gloves? Yeah, well. <laughs> and was the present wrapped? That's what I want to know. What is what? Did she wrap the present for you? Yeah. What? <laughs> you... She gave me the t-shirt with a kitty princess on it. No, but I didn't know if she just gave it to you that way or wrapped it. <laughs> well, no, it was rolled in a ball next to her cat box. No, <laughs> this. <laughs> I thought, wow, this doesn't look like a towel. <laughs> and I, and I, and then, oh my god, it's a t-shirt. Oh. Thank you, Juliet. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's nice to have an animal or, or somebody at this time that we're going through. It is. Truthfully, I don't know if I could have this. I haven't seen, I saw you once for a few minutes. I saw my friend Randy Bell once for half a minute. And that's it. And six weeks, over six weeks now. Yeah. And so it's just me and Juliet. I mean, I feel like I'm married to her. Married a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that movie Cat People, but that's another mm -hmm. story. Um, so stand up, acting, uh, how, it, 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 how do you get out there? I mean, how did you get your foot in the door? Um, it was probably my left foot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, see what a pandemic does to you, man. <laughs> it really weird with it. Okay. No, I started doing stand-up comedy in 1970, October of 78. So the very end of 78. And I started at the comedy store. And in 1980, I was asked to perform for the second annual Media Access Awards by Fernfield. Mm -hmm. And she and introduced me to Norman Lear and Charlotte Ray that night. And I had forgotten that I met Charlotte Ray that night. It was reminded later after my first book was published when I said that I met Norman Lear. Right. 
And she was at that table also. And four months later, I was cast as Blair's cousin in the back of the light. Wow. Boom. Now, I did do one episodic sitcom before Fact of Life, but it didn't get a lot of attention because it was PBS. It wasn't ABC or NBC or CBS, but it was PBS and it was called The Righteous Apples. And I did that in 79 before Fact of Life, my very first episodic sitcom. And the episode was titled to love has two left feet and i was see i told you my left foot again <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have two <laughs> <laughs> and i my dear friend and comic um joey Kamen was one of the stars of the show and i played his girlfriend and he took me home to meet his parents in the episode, and his parents were really upset, but not because I had cerebral palsy, but because I wasn't Jewish. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it was a good. It was a. It was a groundbreaking episode, and it didn't get, like I said, it didn't get the attention that it would have had it been on one of the three major networks at the time. Right. Right. So everybody thinks that Fact of Life was my first break. And it was actually my second. Wow. That's interesting because I, of course, I know a lot about you, but hearing this, whenever you tell a story, this is the amazing thing about you. Whenever you just tell a story, even though people have heard it, it's so fresh and new all the time. It's sort of like the first time they're hearing it. It's the way you deliver it, you know? Well, that's a compliment. Thank you. That's a talent. That's what every comic should have. <laughs> because you tell the same jokes over and over again, and if they're not refreshing, you're not going to last in the industry long. I mean, for years, I had the same routine for many years. And I, I can tell you, you know, my first jokes from way back when, you know. <laughs> You want to tell us? <laughs> well, you know, the first time that I ever performed at the comedy store, there's a little story behind that. And the gentleman who ran the room, his name was Danny Moore. And I had met him previously through my dear friend, Alex Valdez, who was also a stand-up comic, who I give credit for, for getting me in this. And I blame him for getting me in this book. <laughs> uh, but Danny was concerned about me performing on amateur night and putting my name in a hat and hoping that I would get pulled, my, my name would get pulled, because he wasn't sure how the owner, Mitzi Shore, would respond to me. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to grow a little bit as a comedian so that by the time she saw me, I would be polished, you know? And so she, he said, forget standing in line, because the comedian used to come at three o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Stand in line for hours, hoping they'd get on. Me, I used to come to the store on Monday nights at usually 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night, knock on the back door and say, tell Danny Moore that Jerry Jewel's here. And whenever he got that message, he would wait until Missy Shore left the room and then run over to the MC. Okay, int introduce Jerry Jewel now. <laughs> and the first time I ever did that, you know, the MC didn't know who I was, nothing about me. You know, it's amateur night. What do you know about amateur? Yeah. And he just introduced Jerry Jewell from Orange County. Okay. <laughs> you know, I wasn't on the list. So he goes, well, now we have a surprise for you. We have Jerry Jewell from Orange County. Let's give him a big hand. Now, 
because my name was Jerry, he assumed that I was a guy. Yeah. So I walk on stage and you could hear a pin drop. I'm hearing impaired and I could hear the remark. People were looking at each other going, oh my God, it's a he? But, she, but he looks like a she. <laughs> and, and, he, and he or she came all the way from Orange County, drove all the way from Orange County. I mean, what the hell is she on? She's really got, or he, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm hearing all this. But you see, in my mind, I just have to go from what I remembered my jokes were. I didn't know about ad living or responding to any hecklers or anything. It's for the first time I ever did it in that kind of a nightclub experience. So I, so they're whispering all these whispers about me. And then I go up to the microphone and I said, I don't know about you people, but I've been hearing, hearing a lot about all the gays that have been coming out of the closet lately. <laughs> and and now their mouths just fall open. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> and they think that I'm going to be telling them about my transgender experience, <laughs> that I'm not a guy, that I'm a girl, but I used to be, you know? But I said, but I took him totally in another direction within a matter of two seconds. I said, but what you haven't heard about are all the cerebral policy people that have been coming out of the closet. But don't tell anybody. Let that be our secret. Shh. I don't want anybody to know that I have cerebral palsy. It's just, just us. I especially don't want Anita Bryant to know about it because she'll get on another bandwagon and she'll go all over the United States and say, we must stop these people with cerebral poverty from teaching in our public schools. They will influence our children. And before you know it, all our children will be moving and talking like this. <laughs> and they, it brought the house down. I had him in the palm of my hands, got a standing ovation that night. And it, it was amazing. It was surreal. That's what, that's true talent to take somebody and they're sort of like this. And then with, in a certain way, you just like, by the end, they're just laughing and just with you. Yeah, I think my closing line was, I think, because I have it on a little cassette tape somewhere. Yeah. I think I closed the act with, with um, I believe that you can be anything you want to in life if you want to bad enough. And that's why I'm going to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> 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 That was my closing <laughs> Oh my God. You know, I want to, um, God, what, uh, I'm gonna throw out a name to you and tell me what you think. Also, could you get your camera and just move it a little, a little toward the bed? Toward the bed? Yeah, toward. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Not porno? <laughs> no, no, I promise. The porno class is next week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was for a long time, that was the most requested. <laughs> I'm throwing out a name. Kathy Buckley. Kathy Buckley. Kathy Buckley is, is a soul sister. And I met her, I think, in 84, 85. And she said that she had wanted to be a stand-up comic. She told that to Michael Landon. And Michael Landon said, you need to meet Jerry Jewell. And so we met at a Media Access Awards and we became soul sisters. We still are to this day. And she is one of the best stand-up comics. 
that I have ever heard in my lifetime. Well, I, uh, whenever, I mean, I, of course, I know both of you, but to see the two of you together, it is, it feels like soul sisters. I mean, you have this energy about you, these two energies that, you know. We do, we have that, you know, she's six foot two, I'm, no, okay, she's six one. <laughs> <laughs> she might be sick now because they say you shrink when you get older. I mean, I was five four, but now I'm five three, and we're so different. She's deaf. I have cerebral palsy, but people have always confused us our whole career. People come up to her and say, "Oh my God, you're walking so straight now." <laughs> And Kathy looked at him, no, you're thinking of my sister, Jerry Jewel. Oh, cool. <laughs> and I do wear hearing aids. I am hearing impaired, but a lot of people don't know it. And so a lot of people think I'm her and she's me. Hmm. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Well, it shows how close you are and how, you know. We have a very identical energy. We always have. And it's energy. It's, it's a vibration. Yeah. Um, walking as straight as I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a book that you wrote. Although when I said it, I felt, do I? Is, no, Kathy wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got the wrong person. No. <laughs> No, uh, it is my autobiography that I wrote in 2009. It was published in 2011. And it, it was an undertaking. Yeah. I'm writing a book now. We're walking left off. <laughs> and now I'm crawling. <laughs> I'm crawling. I'm crawling. As straight as I can. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's seriously, I mean, I, in fact, I have it. I have it right over here. Hold on. Here we go. There's oh, yeah. that cover. I love this. Thank you. That, that's, I'm very proud of that book. Yeah. And Sunny Back did the photo for that. Book. Oh. The cover photo, wonderful photographer. The beautiful one. I wish my veins were that short now. <laughs> well, by the time this, uh, <laughs> this is over with. By the time this pandemic is over, I'm going to look like Cousin Ed. <laughs> <laughs> da -da -da -da. <laughs> um, uh, I remember when, I, when that came out, I got the book and then I. I also got the um, the book on tape, and I loved listening to that. Whenever I went into the car, I put in another CD, and to hear your voice, and to hear your voice telling your story is what makes that on that. Ah, uh, thank you. That that was um, when I wrote the book. It was very cathartic and healing for me. It was something that I had to do, and I'm writing. Like I said, I'm writing a new book that that takes up where that one left off. And one of the stories in my new book is that when I got the book deal mm -hmm. in 2009, that same week that I got a phone call that we want to publish your book and we had the contracts and blah, 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 blah. Um, that exact same week, I had to return my car to the dealership because I had no money to renew a lease. I had no money to pay my rent, so I had to give up my apartment. I had about $300 to my name in 2009. And Gloria, my wonderful, wonderful sister who I miss. She passed uh, three years ago. Um, 
The one who's in the picture right over there. Yeah, that's Gloria. That's Gloria, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, but she, she, you know, it, it was such an irony. I had a book deal, you know, no huge advance. I mean, this was in 2009. This wasn't like the 80s where you got tons of money in advance to write a book. Yeah. I, I think it was like, fifteen hundred dollars and that was to be paid after I finished writing it so literally I was living on three hundred dollars and um Gloria, you know so, so interesting is how people feel that movie stars and actors have all this money oh I know a lot of people believe that and it's not always true I know it wasn't true in my case <laughs> And Gloria bought me a used car, because I had no car. She bought me a little Mini Cooper. And she let me live in a home which was empty. Um, she was living with her fiance at the time while her home was being renovated. So she bought me a little twin bed, put all my things in storage except my computer and a desk and my cat. Not you, Juliet. This <laughs> this cat was Norma Jean, and we lived in her empty home. All it had was a Viking refrigerator in it. That's it. And my little room with my desk, my computer, and Norma Jean. And had she not given me that safe haven at that time. And she did give me her credit card to pay for food so I wouldn't starve. Yeah. And um, that was the most amazing time. And I'm enjoying writing that chapter now because I can see where a lot of people would have given up at that point. And I didn't. I, I wrote sometimes eight hours a day because I knew that we had a deadline, a contractual deadline to, to finish that book. And I had a commitment. Yeah. And I did it. And I was so proud of myself. Yeah. Uh, well, well you, yeah, it's, it's a gorgeous piece of work. And uh, it shows, too, that we all have our ups and downs in life. And we, we have those high points, we have the low points, but we, you know, it's all about that moment. and, and moving forward. Well, you know what's interesting? I started to read that book online during this pandemic. Yeah. I would read a chapter a day. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And, and truthfully, it got too much because what I discovered was that I was reliving that same thing that I lived through when it happened years ago and I was being re-traumatized. Right. Started that wasn't healing. That's because of what we're going through now, and you know the uncertainty, the anxiety, the uh, you know not knowing what's around the corner, how we're going to survive, and my vulnerability became enhanced when I read about those years when I was feeling even worse. <laughs> and I was, uh, so what I realized is that even though it isn't healing and cathartic for me at this point, it still is for someone else who hadn't lived it once. Right. And one of the things that I did with that book very effectively was made it very balanced. It's not a sob story all the, all the way through. There's so much laughter and joy and fun things to read about it. I made it very balanced with the pain and the joy is going up and down. It's a roller coaster read. Yeah, yeah, it is. It takes you on a ride and that's what a, a good book does. It's not just, and then she went to school and then she, this, this does, it takes you in different directions and surprises you. Um, yeah, I have to give credit to my sister for giving me that safe haven to be able to write that book at that time when I, Juliet, I'm, I'm on Zoom. <laughs> I, 
I pictured her in the potty box. <laughs> Julia? <laughs> <laughs> She just left the room. <laughs> I'm sorry, Juliet. Come back. Uh, yeah, where were we before we were so rudely interrupted by my cat? <laughs> That's okay. I love her. She's a sweet. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I can't. Here's the a question. What, what is your dream role? I have no idea, David. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I don't. I mean, I used to when I was younger. Yeah. I I honestly don't anymore. If if I get any role, that's gonna be a dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you've had dream roles. You were in Facts of Life. You were in yes. Deadwood. Yeah, Facts of Life. Deadwood was a dream role. I I would have never perceived me being in a Western of all things. Wow. And then I did the Deadwood movie a couple of years ago, and that was an incredible experience. Yeah. Yes. So, and I Love Liberty was a dream world. Oh, I was, that was, I have to say, that was one of my favorite specials ever. I Love Liberty. It was an incredible show. It was phenomenal. In fact, that was when I met Patty Duke, or Anna Marie, as she liked to be called later, her real name. Um, and she wrote the forward for I'm Walking As Straight As I Can for me in the 11th hour. And truthfully, one of my dream roles for so many years was to work with Patty Duke. And I, I was so heartbroken when she died because that dream will not be in this lifetime. Right. But I have a book with her forward. I mean, what a, what a wonderful gift she gave me. Think about that, though. You got to work with her in your book. That's yeah, but you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Actress. Yeah. Um, what was one of your greatest moments in life? Oh, God, that's such a vague question. Uh, well, there's so many. There it's, is. Yeah. I mean, I am so blessed. I mean, there are so many great moments. Um, you know, it, it, there are so many, David. Yeah. What's the I'm, first one that comes to your mind? And, and that's a wonderful feeling to have because if it were like, oh, a great moment opposed to a shitty moment, huh? <laughs> God, I don't know if I have any of those, but I have so many. Um, I, I think Norman Lear, when I did I Love Liberty, when he came up on stage and held me in front of 25,000 people. Yeah. And that was an, an enormous moment that I have never forgotten. Um, when I met Liza Minnelli, that was a dream come true for me. Uh, when I met David Cassidy, oh my God, that was, and I still have David Cassidy here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have worn my hair this way variations of it since high school. I had such a crush on him. And when I met him, he was such a sweet... Yeah, I know, Juliet. You never got to meet him. She's upset. But, uh... Yeah, I know! I know! It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe David Cassidy's coming through her right now. <laughs> Hello, Jerry! <laughs> He was so sweet to me. He was such a sweetheart. Uh, very good to me whenever I ran into him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think about, and I, I remember all, 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 so many of these stories are in your book. And Julia, David. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. Are you? No. You guys are going on the road together after this is over. <laughs> Don't you dare get on that, Juliet. Juliet, I'm wearing your shirt. <laughs> what? Pull oh, out. I love it. Okay. One of the biggest joys was when I met Carol Burnett. But whenever, when everyone asks me what is your greatest moment, you, you automatically think, oh, would you be quiet? <laughs> um, I love you. Anyways, oh, good. Oh, that was not necessary. That was not a word that Kitty should use. <laughs> but when people ask me what my greatest moment was, you automatically think you're talking about your career, right? And why didn't everybody, anybody talk about great moments that they had before their career? And I would say one of my greatest moments was meeting Carol Burnett in 1974 yeah. or 70. I don't remember the exact year. I was 16. Yeah. 17. And I had ordered tickets to the Carol Burnett show at CBS Studios. And it was a big, great event. My God, I'm going to meet my idol, Carol Burnett. And we got a front row seat, which made it even more, a more spectacular dream. Oh my God. <laughs> and I went with three friends of mine, had four tickets. Yeah. And at the beginning of the show, when she says bump up the lights and accept questions from the audience, I thought, oh, this is gonna be my dream come true. And I raised my hand. She never called on me. And I was so bummed. And my friends were like, Jerry, shh, shh. no, I can't believe she didn't call on me. Shh. <laughs> and the show was starting, and I, and I was like, I can't believe she wouldn't. Would you shut up, Jerry? Just shut up. <laughs> and now, what I didn't realize at the time was I was in the middle of Carol Burnett making history wearing the drapes on his shoulders with um you were at that show gone with the wind the parody of gone with the wind yeah i was there that night when they did that and they got the longest laughter that the carol the next show had ever gotten ever and i was there that night well that night harvey Corman lost it because tim conway kept cracking him up so they had to take a break, which was typical of them. And I'm not taking a break, but Tim Conway cracking Harvey up so badly. Yeah. And they had to stop and take a break. So as soon as they took a break, I got right back into the conversation with my friend. I can't believe he didn't call me. <laughs> I needed to talk to her. I had so much to say to her. And my friend Audrey, she said, Jerry, well, you better think of what you want to say to her right now, because she's coming right over here. Oh, she is not. <laughs> yes, she is. And right when Audrey said that, Carol extended her hand and said, hi, you must be Jerry Jewell. And I was stunned. I was like, how did you know it was me? And she said, oh, just a clue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I had written her letters since I was 13. Yeah. And she said, I have all your letters. And I want you to know that I hang your poetry up in my office so everybody can read it when they come in. She was so sweet. And she said, I'm so glad I got to meet you, Jerry. And I said, well, likewise. And I said, Carol, can you do me one more favor before you leave? And she said, what's that? And I said, well, 
I wrote a, a paper about you for my English class, and it'll be a lot better grade if you autograph it. <laughs> and she did. Oh. And I still have it in storage somewhere. So that was a high like I you can't even imagine. And because Audrey was a wheelchair user, we had a separate way to get out of the studio. We got to use the elevator right. that all the stars used. And Harvey Corman stepped in the elevator with us. And I was like, oh, oh my God, it's Harvey Corman. <laughs> and he smiled and said, yeah, it is, kid. <laughs> What's your name? And my friends were just cracking up because I was, I was walking on cloud line. Wow. Oh my God. That's such an amazing story. I, I, and I've heard, I've heard it before, but again, I'm listening to it and it's like fresh and brand new. And it's like, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, let's see. I have a few more questions. Um, Corey Allen. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's what's a word or a thought that comes to your mind when I say Corey Allen? Corey Allen, you introduced me to Corey Allen, and he's just an amazing actor, director, human. Yeah. And I remember when I took his acting class with you, actually. Yeah. Juliet, would you be? You know what? Juliet <laughs> says she wants to be on camera. She's. <laughs> <laughs> she says, I haven't been seen yet. <laughs> no, but I had just come off of Deadwood, I think it was, I believe. The, the TV show. When I met uh, Chloe Allen. Right. And so, you know, I wanted to take the acting class because I had read about Corey Allen and I thought, what a wonderful opportunity. So when I when you offered that course with Corey, I was like, oh my God, I gotta do that. And we we did our acting, you know, assignments every every evening that we had the class. And one night I, I forget who I was working with. There was another student. I, we worked with all different kinds of students every time. And I had memorized my lines to do a scene. And I was on my hands and knees on the floor um, saying my lines. It was part of the character. There was a reason for it. Not because I was just doing it. It was part of the script. And Coy gets down on his hands and knees and puts his face right in front of mine. And he said, you know, ever since you've been in this class, everybody was going, I want to work with Jerry Jewell. I want to sing with Jerry Jewell. I want to do that with Jerry Jewell. And I never could see what they were so in awe of. But now that you're on your hands and knees and your face is to the floor, I get it. <laughs> Thank you, Coy. <laughs> uh, oh, oh wait, he I just felt him. <laughs> He's uh, well question. Define disability. What about disability? What is your definition of disability? And what is your <laughs> definition of ability? Yeah. Um Disability, well, it's a word. It, it's definitive. It defines something as unable, mm. in my mind. But it, but also, you know, I can't deny it. I do have a disability. Um, the secret is, is defining your ability in spite of the disability. That's the challenge of it. Yeah. I mean, look at, I have a cat that won't shut up. 
Over here. Oh, look at that bottom. <laughs> Juliet, now that you're on camera, how do you feel? Hi, <laughs> Hi Juliet. <laughs> Hi, baby. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the, yeah, I got it, Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> She's talkative today. I love it. She is the most talkative cat I have ever had in my life. And when I take my hearing aids out, it is heaven because I can't hear her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but they're in, and now I know. Yeah, I got it. I know you're my baby. Happy Mother's Day. And is that what you wanted to say to me? Ah, uh, she gave me a kiss. Oh, happy, well, you're her mama. I am her mama. See, now she's relaxed. Oh. I thought so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to ultimately doing our show, Nuts, Fruits, and Other Mixed Blessings, one of these days. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. And Juliet, too. <laughs> Juliet, thank you, Juliet. I'll put you in the credits. <laughs> Alexander will put you in the credits. <laughs> She's pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs>